Hello, my name is Jo Morgan. I'm a maths teacher and I write the blog resourceaholic.com. Uh, today I'm presenting a workshop that I ran at Brew Ed Maths back in January 2020 and the workshop is called Bursting Our Method Bubbles. I wonder if you know how maths is done in other parts of the world. I wonder if you take any topic that you teach in your classroom. So, for example, if you're a secondary teacher, that might be um, solving quadratics or it might be uh, simultaneous equations. It might be finding the nth term of a sequence. Um, if you teach A level, it might be polynomial division. Um, if you're a primary teacher, it might be subtraction, multiplication, division. Um, think about these things and think, do you know how they're taught in other parts of the world? Um, because interestingly, when we connect with teachers in other countries, which we can do in all sorts of ways, and Twitter, for example, is one of those ways that we can exchange information with teachers in other countries, we find, um, surprisingly perhaps, because maths is maths, right? But we find that actually the way that things are done are different all over the world. And a really good example of that is um, the rule of three for solving proportion problems. Um, the rule of three is something that used to be used universally in England, it was absolutely the standard method to solve proportion problems. Not anymore. Most teachers don't use that approach, but it is still used in many, many countries in the world. This diversity is fascinating, this diversity of methods. Um, and I think that when we find out about new methods or discover that the way that we do things isn't necessarily done universally, we are bursting method bubbles. So we're coming out of the bubbles that we live in. And those bubbles we live in are very much um, created by the way that we were taught maths at school um, and the way that we see maths being taught in in classrooms in our schools um, and that kind of dictates how we teach maths but actually there's a whole world of methods that we can explore um, I wonder if you know how the things that you teach are taught um, in Scotland um, and in different parts of the country so in different areas in England, um, in Ireland, in Wales, in all the different parts of the UK, we teach things differently. It always fascinates me, for example, that at um, A level or in Scottish hires, um, algebraic division is taught by synthetic division, which is something that most English maths teachers have never even heard of. This, this uh, diversity of methods is something that we really should all know about and we should burst our method bubbles so that we can learn about the other way that teachers do things. And that will help us to make informed decisions about how we choose to do things. Um, when I presented this talk, I did it in Croydon and I talked to the teachers about whether they knew um, how things were done even in other parts of London. So, you know, we think, oh, this diversity is, is different parts of the world, but actually, I bet if you were to visit a school um, in one part of London, they might be using one particular method to do, say, for example, multiplication or to do uh, or to expand brackets um, or to find uh, interior angles in polygons and you go to a school um, just up the road and you'll find they might be doing things very differently. Um, and interestingly, I wonder if you know how things are taught in the classroom next door to yours, um, because I think that there are some schools where there is a consistency of methods across departments and everyone knows how everyone else teaches things. But there are other schools where we just don't know what the other teachers are doing in their classrooms. And there have been uh, cases, certainly in my career, where I've taken on a class and I have assumed that they've done something in one way. And it turned out that their last teacher had taught them to do it in a different way. Um, and that is, again, it's so interesting that this is the diversity of methods exists not just across the world and not just within cities, but actually within schools, that we're not all teaching the same thing. And we really need to burst our method bubbles and find out how do other people do things. And it doesn't mean that we need to all change the way that we do stuff, but we really should know um, about the different methods being used um, by our colleagues and by teachers um, all over the world. Um, I want to give an example of the bursting of one of my method bubbles. Um, and this one is of a factorising non-monic quadratic. So let's say factorising a quadratic um, that starts with a 3x squared, for example. So that's what we mean by a non-monic. Um, now for this one, um, this is one where there's quite a debate about what the best method is. Now I don't believe in best methods. Um, and this is, um, this is one where I duck when there's a Twitter chat about this 
uh, this particular topic because I think probably about once every two months someone will tweet and say so what is the best method for factorizing a non-monic and loads of people will reply stating what they think the best method is and this really frustrates me because I'm going to say there is no best um, there is no research to show which one's best and even then we haven't got a definition of what best means but there is no research so we shouldn't be saying this one is better it's fine to share our opinions and say I've actually tried a couple of methods and and I think this one is the one that I found works best for my students I think that's fine but quite often teachers are saying this is the way you should be doing it when they've never tried or explored any alternative there are loads of different ways to factorize non-monics and there's different ways used all over the world um, I always did them at school by inspection and I find its inspection totally logical so I look at a quadratic um, I write out my double brackets I know what the coefficients of the X terms should be um, and then I have a go at figuring out what the constants are just by using some logic and just sort of piecing it together and when I first became a teacher I tried to teach my students that and um, they were so used to algorithms and procedures that they um, they said they wanted me to teach them some steps Steps to follow so they didn't want this kind of um, idea of just have a think about it and you should be able to figure it out um, they wanted some steps so I went online um, and this was a long time ago so this uh, before I was on Twitter before I could have asked um, other opinions from other people and I found what's called the grouping method some people call it the AC method um, and that's been around for um, decades that is not a new method at all and it's a method that goes in fashions so sometimes that's a method that's really popular and in all the textbooks and sometimes inspection is in all the textbooks and no one's mentioning grouping but anyway I discovered this grouping method I taught my students and I gave them the option and I said you can either do it the way I do it or you can use grouping now I don't want to talk about the pros and cons of the methods now um, but what happened there was this was me having a, a method bubble burst where I only knew inspection and that's because that was that's what I'd been taught and I'd never taken the time to find out any alternatives um, my method bubble was burst and I discovered here's another way that's really commonly used um, and that was fantastic for me um, because it was really it enhanced my subject knowledge and it made me a better teacher because I had this I had I, I knew more about this topic um, I now know there are loads of other ways of doing it and some are better than others um, but this is what I mean by bursting our method bubbles it's about finding out um, other ways that teachers do things that we maybe we have never heard of before now, last year, I wrote a book called A Compendium of Mathematical Methods, and that's where I pulled together um, methods for lots of different topics. Um, I did loads of research into um, the, all the different methods used all over the world and all the different methods used um, in the history of maths. So going back a long, long time, looking at old textbooks and how things used to be taught. Um, and I was uh, talking to my mum about this book and, and she wasn't she's not particularly interested in maths or, um, or, or, or any of the sort of stuff that I'd pulled together for this book but I was just trying to sort of um, engage her in, um, in in a little bit of what I'd done and I and I wrote out this and I said look if I was doing a subtraction and this is what I do and and I hadn't even started to explain the method but literally I just uh, did this so I crossed out the eight and wrote a seven and wrote a one and for the vast majority of people watching this that would be totally familiar and that would be how you do it and she looked at me like I was crazy she said what have you done there you have crossed out the wrong number I thought you were a math teacher you've made a basic mistake in subtraction and I said oh that's interesting mum um what would you have done and she said well I would have done this and she drew this out um, and there we had it there we have a uh, a totally different method um, she thought my method was crazy she'd never said never she'd never seen it before obviously that means she didn't pay much attention when I did my maths homework at school um, but I had never well there were, a few years ago I would have never have seen her method before I have now seen her method because I've done a lot of research into this um, but this was really interesting to me that my mum does a different method of subtraction to me and um, to, to her my method is really unusual now what I do is the decomposition method and I was taught this at primary school and this is very very widely taught at primary schools now um, and has been for a long time 
Um, now, this, if we look at how the decomposition method works, um, most of you will be familiar with this. I wanted to do 4, subtract 7, and I didn't want to write a negative um, in the difference at the bottom. Um, there are methods where we can write a negative, but not in this one. So instead of writing a negative number, instead I regroup um, the 84, and instead I write 84 as uh, 70 plus 14, which is the same as 84, and then I can I have a 14, and that means I can subtract the 7, and that means that the uh, subtraction is now something that I can do without having to go near negatives. Um, so that regrouping is the key to decomposition. Now we know that decomposition has been used for decades in England um, and has also been used all over the world. Here's an example from a Chinese textbook where they're saying, how are we gonna do the, um, the six, uh, take away the eight in the subtraction 36 minus eight? And um, they're talking about unbundling the 10. So basically regrouping uh, one of the tens um, so that we can do that subtraction. So it's a really commonly used method all over the world. The way that my mum does it, um, she went to school in the 50s, um, was, um, it's, it's a method called equal addition. Um, and it's actually quite a lovely method and it makes a lot of sense once you can understand what's going on. It just doesn't look very familiar to, to many teachers um, who weren't taught this at school. So what we do here is we say, um, if I want to do 84 subtract 27, then actually I could add 10 to the menu end and add 10 to the subtract end. And what that does is um, it shifts the whole subtraction to become 94 take away 37. And we know that 84 subtract 27 is the same as 94 subtract 37. They're the same, there's the same difference. We know that if you take a subtraction and move it up the number line, then you end up with the same difference. Um, so here, the 10 in the menu end is added to the ones column and the tens in the subtract end is added to the tens column. It doesn't matter where we add them as long as we're adding 10 to each of the menu end and the subtract end. Um, so that means we end up with um, a subtraction we can do because first of all we do 14 subtract 7 and then we do 8 subtract 3 and we get the same answer as obviously as we did in the decomposition method. Um, so these are just different ways of looking at it. They're both subtraction, they're both the same idea. One was regrouping and one was equal addition. Interestingly, uh, when I first did some presentations about this method, I had this tweet. Um, I finally understand the way I was taught subtraction in the 80s. I was taught the equal addition method as a trick with no explanation. We were told taught it as a Jimmy to the top and a Jimmy to the bottom. And I had no idea who or what Jimmy was. I mean, that is interesting, isn't it? Because both methods, regrouping or decomposition and equal addition, can be taught um, with no understanding at all. And you can say the same as any algorithm. So students can just be taught cross out this, put a number there, cross out this, put a number there. They have no idea what they're doing. Um, now, this uh, teacher was taught equal addition in the 80s. Um, so I'm talking about my mum being taught it in the 50s. I know that it was then uh, taught less so um, for decades afterwards until it got to the point where decomposition became very much the dominant method. But if you look at um, the early heart part of the 19th century, um, decomposition and equal addition were both taught as dominant methods. They were taught, um, there was no, they were taught just as much as each other. So half the country would have been taught decomposition and half would have been taught equal addition. Um, and both may have been taught without any understanding of why they worked. So there's the two methods side by side. The efficiency is identical. It's the same number of pen marks that we are making in each case. And they were done in the same kind of way with this kind of mechanical crossing out and replacing. Um, you know, in the method I was taught, you're crossing things out on the top row. In the method my mum was taught, we're crossing things out on the second row. Um, but the time it takes is the same. Um, and But actually the kind of underlying mass is slightly different. You know, the, we're regrouping or we're adding 10 to um, subtract end and the menu end, and that's, that's a different way of dealing um, with these subtraction problems. Um, but that contrast um, is really interesting to me in the fact that many people have never heard of the equal addition method, even though it was very, very widely taught for a very long time. Um, my mum hilariously was so interested in the fact that she subtracts differently to me. She did a little survey. She did a survey of her friends at the pub, um, her friends that go to badminton and her colleagues at work. Um, and she came up with this little uh, very unscientific uh, survey results. Um, she had um, most people um, from varying ages um, use my method, decomposition. 
um, there were a few people that used her method, equal addition, and there were a few people that had no idea how to do a basic two digit subtraction, including some people in their 20s. Um, so that's a little bit worrying um, that people can't remember um, something that they've really done since a very young age. Um, but there you have it, that sort of a variety of methods. My mum just wanted to check that she wasn't the only person who knew this uh, equal addition method, and she showed that she actually did have a few friends um, who also use that method. So the two methods side by side there, and I guess the question is, um, wh how do, have we done any research into which one's better than the other? And how is it that most schools now do decomposition, whereas it, whereas it used to be that, that very many schools taught equal addition? Um, the, Interestingly, there is a lot of research into this, more so than any other topic that I've looked into. This is where the research is uh, plentiful. There was a lot of time spent on deciding which of these two methods was the best. So I've looked at um, a paper, the relative methods of the methods, sorry, the relative merits of the methods of teaching subtraction, um, and this was, was a looked at uh, studies of 19,000 children. This was huge. They looked at children who had been taught each of the two methods, so children who'd been taught equal addition, children who'd been taught decomposition, and they were tested for accuracy and speed. Now we're not so interested in speed these days. We're not bothered if students can do these quick because they, they, these, these children won't be going into professions where they have to do lots and lots of mental arithmetic very quickly. Um, accuracy, perhaps more, um, more interesting, but also understanding. Now, that wasn't part of these studies. No one checked whether these children really understood what was going on. Um, and that's something probably that would be a feature of an equivalent study that we do these days, because we're more interested in whether children understand the maths than whether they can do it really quickly. It's a fascinating, very, very large study um, done in the in the early 1900s, which was when a lot of time was spent thinking about methods, far more time than than we're doing now. So it used to be that methods were something that maths teachers talked about a lot. Um, the, the study said this, or the paper I read said this, one of the most debated questions in the teaching of arithmetic is that of the method to be used for subtraction. They were trying to figure out a best method. Now, like I said earlier, I don't believe in best methods, but they were trying to figure out which method should win and um, because there really was a, a fight between these two methods. It was a fight between decomposition and equal addition. Um, half the teachers in the country very strongly felt that decomposition was the best method to teach and the other half felt that equal addition was um, and there was no agreement there was no consistency um, it was very people were very stuck with with their in their ways with this and didn't want to adopt a different method didn't want to change the way that they'd always done this um, interestingly the conclusion of the study was this I recommend that the method of equal additions be universally taught as the practical method for working subtraction. So the, the conclusion was equal additions was better. And even though this, it was concluded that this was a, um, a far better method than decomposition and that all this, at least 19,000 students in the study, all that evidence suggested that equal additions was the better method. Interestingly, come forward 50 years and we are, or even longer, 70 years, and we are all now using decomposition. So it seems that the um, outcome of this study um, was perhaps ignored um, and somehow decomposition ended up being the winner of the methods fight. Now, of course, there are loads of different ways to subtract. And in my uh, the chapter on subtraction, which is the first chapter in my book, um, A Compendium of Mathematical Methods, I have all of these different methods and they're all really interesting. Um, the first two are the ones I've just talked about. But there are loads of lovely ways to do subtraction that are really fun to explore. I'm not suggesting we teach uh, children all these ways. In fact, I expect that most teachers, or even after reading this chapter, will continue to teach de decomposition. Um, however, these are really fun just for teachers to, to have, have a play with. And this, this, is, this is really great for subject knowledge development. It helps us to understand subtraction more if we can understand how each of these methods actually work. Um, after I wrote my book, I actually discovered another way of subtracting that I didn't include. Um, I saw this one um, at a talk at Math Jam back in um, November 2019. Um, and I hadn't thought of this before, and it was really interesting. Have a look at this. Same problem as before, 84 subtract 27. Um, 
And here we're going to do the 8 subtract the 2 and get 6. And at this point, while we're looking and we think we want to do 4 subtract 7, so what are we going to do? We're actually going to uh, borrow from that 6. So that becomes a 5, and then we've uh, got a 14 subtract 7 there. Now that actually works, and that gives us the correct answer. Um, and I found that quite surprising. Never seen that before. Um, didn't really know what was going on. Um, and I thought that was um, a really nice method um, just to sort of have a think about. And, and this is to me, this is the fun thing, is thinking about, well, how did that work? Why does that give me the correct answer? Um, in this case, what's happening? is we're saying, um, I want to do four subtract seven. And I know that's the same as 14 subtract seven, take subtract 10. So what, I, what I'm saying there is that if I change that four at the top to a 14, that's fine, as long as I take away 10 from the answer, from the difference. Okay, so four subtract seven is the same thing as 14 subtract seven subtract 10. OK, you can see that. So if I want to uh, put, uh, change my 4 to a 14, I'm allowed to do that as long as I make my difference 10 less. Um, that to me was just really fun to have a play with and something that I had not seen when I did the research for my book, which just goes to show that I, I think I've captured all the subtraction methods and there are even more that I didn't know about. This one um, was taught um, in uh, other parts of the world. Um, there's, like I've said before, this diversity in um, internationally and also over time. So some methods were taught historically and some are still taught in other parts of the world. Um, something that I've seen a lot in old textbooks is they call it a proof, and I suppose proof might not be the right word, but a check, a verification that subtraction is correct. Now, we probably we all know this, but I'm not sure we tell our students to do it specifically. So here we're saying that once you've done a subtraction, so once you have done the, you've got the menu end and the subtra hand and you do the subtraction and you get what they call the remainder. We tend to call that the difference now. Um, and then and then the, what they want us to do is then add the subtra hand and the remainder um, and that should then give us the minuend. So you can see that here you do the subtraction and you get the second and third line of working. You add the second and third line of working together and that should of course give you the same thing as the top line. Um, addition is way easier than subtraction so checking your answer by addition is a very sensible thing to do. Um, this was standard in old textbooks, this idea of checking as part of the process. It's, it's an integrated part of subtraction is to then check your answer in the same level layout, so in that column layout, an immediate check of answers. Um, I suppose it's something that we all know that, that we can check our answer in this way, but we don't necessarily build it in to our, um, our column layout like they used to. Um, this is from a Japanese textbook and it says use addition to check your answers and it's probably the same in, in, in textbooks from the UK as well where they'll give this little suggestion of this is how you should check um, but but it's not it's not laid out in that same way so it's not sort of made so obvious that it's actually really easy and it's sort of ready to check. Um, now this is from a Japanese textbook and actually there's some lovely stuff in this Japanese textbook that I'll just quickly share with you just because it's it's delightful stuff. Um, first of all, the chapter on um, on subtraction um, algorithms starts with this wonderful introductory page. Um, so it says that first, if you look at if you look at the top there, we've got addition road, and the journey down addition road takes us past one digit ranch over regrouping pond um, and into algorithm square. And when I did this talk at Brewed, someone pointed out that that algorithm square is in fact a circle. <laughs> Um, and at the bottom, subtraction road leads past one digit forest. So that's the first thing that children learn in their uh, path along uh, understanding subtraction. Then they go through regrouping hill. So they're learning how to subtract by regrouping, um, perhaps using number lines, understand their number bonds. And then they end up in algorithm square where they're bringing that together to do bigger problems in more efficient ways. I think that was a really lovely graphic. It's sort of it's just it's, it's really nice to see those journeys drawn out like that. Um, in the chapter on subtraction, um, we can see that they are using visuals alongside the algorithm, which is standard for these Japanese textbooks. So here we're doing 45 subtract 18, and they've got those uh, the, the 45 um, drawn out in the blocks, and alongside it they have how the algorithm looks, and then they're showing that regrouping 
um, with the diagrams um, and presumably in the lesson they would be doing that um, with the manipulatives as well. But you can see it's the same method. It's the regrouping method, decomposition, which is so commonly taught in, um, in uh, the UK um, as well as clearly in Japan as well. Um, there's a bigger example there uh, doing 402 subtract 175 and again it's drawn out and alongside it they have the, uh, the, the column um, algorithm and again it's trying to explain how that regrouping works. Um, this isn't anything um, unusual, this is uh, similar to the sort of thing you hopefully you would see in textbooks um, in this country but I just think it's always really interesting to have a look at how things are done in other countries. Um, when researching uh, subtraction, I discovered some videos from, um, these are from the States, um, and it was interesting to see the way that they label or the, the names they give to these methods. So that this one at the top left they call uh, right to left or traditional subtraction. So that's what I would call decomposition. And we're all very familiar with that one. And then we have uh, left to right. Um, and so the top right, the method they call left to right, they call it mental math. And that's where if I want to subtract 156, I can first take off 100, then I can take off 50, and then I can take off six. Um, now, um, again, in my book, I give that a different name, but it sort of seems fairly obvious um, that that could work. And why is it not commonly used? I guess that's an efficiency thing of having to do multiple steps when with the decomposition method, we're kind of bundling everything up into a single a single uh, line of working and um, what they've called the Singapore method here and um, they're saying that th this is something I'd call a constant difference method um, and it's similar to the equal addition method um, that was that was so widely taught there they're saying well if we subtract six from both the minuend and the subtrahend then we end up with a problem that's actually much easier to solve so we end up with something where we don't have to do any uh, regrouping um, and then uh, bottom right, they've uh, called that method counting up or giving change. Um, and we're saying if I want to do um, $3.60, take away $1.56, then I can start with my $1.56 and say, what do I need to add on to that to get to $3.60? And that's the way a shopkeeper would work out uh, change. Um, it, it used to be sometimes referred to as the Austrian method or the Austrian shopkeeper's method. Um, I don't know why necessarily Austria, because obviously this is a the way that shopkeepers work out change is, is um, or, you know, when they used to do it in their head, um, was probably pretty universal all over the world. You take the amount that's been given to you and you say right how do I add that up to the amount that um, I needed um, and but it's really there's all the this is just a, a small selection but it's really interesting to see these methods being explored this was in the states now in the States, they introduced Common Core. Um, they did this big uh, reform of maths um, where they tried to bring a lot more understanding and less algorithms into their classrooms. So they said that they really want children to understand why these things work. And interestingly, they were met with a lot of resistance, particularly from parents. Um, you might have seen this clip from The Incredibles where the, the dad, uh, Mr. Incredible, he gets really annoyed with his son's maths homework because he's saying that's not the way I know. But this is actually, this is quite frustrating because this was the reaction, not so much in um, in this country, but in the States, there's this, this sort of a horror from parents that how dare you change the methods that we knew really well at school? How dare you try and do things differently? You've made things more complicated. Um, and that's just, I mean, it's very human to be nervous of things that you're not familiar with, um, but it is quite frustrating um, that, that, you know, parents are so adamant that the way they were taught was right, when actually these parents might not even be able to explain why these methods work. They're just things that they know how to do because they were taught to do them um, Algorithm, algorithmically and, and actually some of these methods um, really could do with um, at least us thinking about whether we're doing them in the right way, whether they are the right methods and even if we don't change things we, the methods are really worthy of our time and attention. Um, we shouldn't just accept that the methods we currently teach are the right ones. They, they, this is something that we really all as a profession should be um, doing some research into and some thinking about. And the final thing I want to show you is on, um, this is from the NECTM, and this was just really interesting to me because I'd never really thought about before the cognitive load involved in a decomposition method because you're trying to do two things at once, basically. If you think about the idea of subtraction where you have to carry, then you're, or, or, or sorry, regroup, then it means that you are having to do a couple of things at once. You're having to um, borrow or regroup, subtract, check the next number, regroup, 
subtract, check the next, check the next number, regroup, subtract, and it's like two things going on at once. And actually, there are, there's an alternative to that. So this is from the NACTM, and they say, which of these calculations require exchange? So that means regrouping. And we can look at this and say, well, that first one, I can subtract the three from the three, the one from the six, and the two from the five without having to do any regrouping at all. So that one is straightforward. Nothing, nothing complicated about that question. Whereas in the next one, so top middle, the first thing I look at is I see two subtract seven, and that actually will require me to do some regrouping. Um, and then that means that I would regroup that, um, I would, I would, if in my language, borrow, so this is very old fashioned language to use the word borrow, but I would borrow from that eight, and then the next step, I'm gonna have to regroup again. Um, so that's one that would require exchange. The questions the NEC, um, NECTM document poses are which require exchange, which require exchange just once, which ones require exchange twice, and which ones require exchange through a zero so that's where it gets a bit complicated if you look at the bottom right and the bottom left in fact um, you're having to borrow from zero um, which is perhaps the most complicated column subtractions that we could do now the suggestion here is that if we first identify that exchange is required, we could do all the regrouping first before we do the subtraction. And then cognitively, we're separating out the two uh, procedures that we need to do. So we're not having to do two things at once. So if you think about how that works here, we know that we're gonna have to regroup the eight um, because there's no way we're doing uh, two minus five, uh, sorry, two minus seven here. So we will regroup that to call uh, 82 becomes 70 and 12 um, and then um, we're gonna we see that we're then gonna have to do a 7 subtract 9 for that middle column and and that's gonna be a problem so we're gonna regroup again and we're going to um, we're gonna cross out that 4 and change it to a 3 and that means that we can bring that 1 across into the tens column so now we're in a situation where we are able to just do the subtraction in one go. And here we can go right to left or left to right, and either will work. The only reason we have to go um, right to left when we do normal subtractions is because we regroup as we go and we have to regroup in that direction. If you don't need to do any regrouping, it doesn't matter which direction you go. Um, so here I could do 3, take away 1, I could do 17, take away 9, and I could do 12, take away 7. And there's my difference. And that was um, in, that would have worked if I'd gone the other way. And it's really straightforward if I've done the regrouping first. Now, I was quite surprised that I'd never really thought about this. And actually, I think that this is perhaps, it's, this is decomposition, but perhaps... Um, a slightly better version of the decomposition that I was taught at school and that most children are taught now, which is to do check for the regrouping, do the subtraction, check for the regrouping, do the subtraction. Hey, why not do all the regrouping, then do all the, re all the subtraction? It just seems perhaps it comes with a little bit more understanding um, and, and, a, and it, requires, um, it, it requires a bit less of a kind of overload of stuff happening at once. Maybe. I haven't done any research into this. I just think it's really interesting. Um, so this is a traditional method, decomposition, that's been adapted. Um, I'm not saying it's a new method, I'm just saying that um, adapting existing methods is something else that is worth thinking about. I would say that all of this is subject knowledge development for teachers. So developing our subject knowledge um, comes in all sorts of ways. Um, there's, you, know, you can develop your subject knowledge by learning about history of, um, of maths, by understanding a bit more about etymology of maths words. You can develop your subject knowledge by um, learning uh, more advanced maths than you've done before, like if you've never taught A-level, teaching yourself some A-level. Um, but learning about different methods is another brilliant way that maths teachers can develop their subject knowledge. So it's about understanding that for everything we teach, there's a whole load of different ways of doing things and then trying to figure out how they work and why they work. Um, even if we're not going to teach those methods, just the, the process of finding out about them is brilliant subject knowledge development for teachers. Um, my book, A Compendium of Math Mathematical Methods, came out in December. Um, I am very happy to talk to people about methods um, that they think I might not have seen. So please drop me an email if you think that there's a way of doing things that um, I haven't included in my book, because I would absolutely love to hear about it. Um, and I really hope that um, uh, if you read my book, that really helps to burst your method bubbles. So does it help you to come out of the method shell that you've been living in and just find out about some stuff that you didn't know about before? Thank you for watching.